بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستهديه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وسلم تسليما كثيرا مزيدا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد This is our eighth class on the chapter of Siyam from the book Zad al-Mustaqna and uh, we left off at the author's statement وَيَلْزَمُ الصَّوْمُ وَيَلْزَمُ الصَّوْمُ لِكُلِّ مُسْلِمٍ مكلف قادر ويلزم الصوم لكل مسلم مكلف قادر. When you reflect on the work of the ulama that we whose books we study, you see very well that it's uh, structured and organized, although it may not be a, may not appear to be so. Not only do we learn the fiqh of fasting with this type of work, when you study the work of the classical ulama. But you also learn how they structure their work, which makes it easier for you to go through in the future. And it also makes it easier for you to go refer to it when you need it as a reference. That's all some of the bonuses you get on top of the knowledge you gain from studying their work. Therefore, pay attention to the organization of the book. Just like you do to the substance of what we study, that's why everyone has to have their own copy. One needs to be very familiar with the books of the ulama. Very familiar. You have to know where it's at and how to get it and where to look for it. That's why we base and attach our study on their work. Notice the order here. After he mentions how Ramadan starts and ends, the next issue would be, who's the one who's going to fast? What type of people are going to fast? Who must fast? He said, وَيَلْزَمُ الصَّوْمُ لِكُلِّ مُسْلِمٍ مُكَلَّفٍ قَادِرٍ وَيَلْزَمُ He said, وَيَلْزَمُ يَلْزَمُ is a word that the author used instead of يَجِبُ meaning it's obligatory, ob obligatory. They can be used interchangeably to say that it's must, it's a prescribed, it's a, a, a obligatory, it's a fard. But why did he use yalzam instead of using fard or wajib? It's really, the reason he did that was really uh, to change the terms in his writing as an artistic way of keeping the reader attached and interested in thinking while he goes through his book. And this is widespread among the fuqaha. Sometimes they'll use yalzam instead of Yajib. But you will know that when he says Yalzam, he, he's saying Yajib. And you know that also through the context of the sentence that he's uh, stated. He said, Fasting is wajib or lazim, Yalzam. Fasting is wajib, it's fard, it's obligatory. Is all fasting wajib? Or is he talking about some type of specific fasting? He's talking actually about a certain type of fasting, which is the wajib type, namely speaking, Ramadan. He didn't specify that, but he means Ramadan. How do we know that? Because we said in Arabi, and I went through it, I believe in, uh, in uh, uh, the Tawheed classes, and also early on in these classes, Al in as Al, the in as refers to Al-Ahd al dhihni we took Al-Ahd al-Dhihni. Al-Ahd al-Dhihni, we said in Arabic grammar, means that it refers to that which you know. Meaning, the fasting that's obviously on your mind. The fasting that's understood by common sense for one who's reading this. Meaning, Al-Ahd al-Dhihni means that it's automatically understood by the listener what I'm trying to say. So there's no need to specify it. What fasting is he talking about that we really understand when we read it? He's talking about the fasting of Ramadan. So it's as or the al in it is for al-ahd al-dhihni. The author said, وَيَلْزَمُ أَصَّوْمُ لِكُلِّ مُسْلِمٍ وَيَلْزَمُ أَصَّوْمُ لِكُلِّ مُسْلِمٍ What's prescribed? He said, 
fast in Ramadan and every Muslim is prescribed. That's a very general and broad statement. لِكُلِّ مُسْلِمٍ He wants to tell us now who Ramadan is prescribed on. Who are the people who must fast? The first condition for fasting that he states is one being Muslim. You must be a Muslim. When we say Islam is a condition for fasting, or if you read it in other chapters of the fiqh books, you see that Islam is a condition for salah. It doesn't, he's not trying to exempt the kafir from salah. It's telling you from a fuqaha perspective that in order for you to fulfill the salah or the siyam, you have to be a Muslim. It's a condition. In order for the fast to be accepted, it must be from a Muslim. That's what they're trying to tell you. And I'm going to elaborate on this point a little bit later on, inshallah. So the issue, we have an issue here. For example, we have some issues here. If one embraces Islam on the day of Eid, does he need to make up that entire Ramadan? He comes on the Eid, he declares his shahad in front of everyone. No, he doesn't make up his Ramadan. The day he took his shahada was like the day he was born, free of his sins. He's on a fresh slate in a fresh beginning. That day he'll be with a clear slate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He doesn't have to make up any of the Ramadans that passed. It's considered by ijma, by consensus, that when a non-Muslim embraces Islam, takes his shahada, he does not make up the fasting of the previous Ramadans. What's the proof on that? There's ijma. But there's also other, plenty of other proof. قُلِّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا إِنْ يَنْتَهُوا يُغْفَرْ لَهُمْ مَا قَدْ سَلَفْ Say to those who have disbelieved, if they cease from their kufr, their past will be forgiven. يُغْفَرْ لَهُمْ مَا 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 means everything in the past, everything is going to be forgiven. Included in that is past Ramadans that they did not fast. There's also a hadith when the tribe of Waf Thaqif, they came to the masjid of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and embraced Islam with the Messenger uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They camped in the masjid, they stayed in the masjid. The hadith says they fasted the remainder of that Ramadan. Meaning, they didn't fast what they missed in the early, in the first portion of Ramadan when they were non-Muslim. They re After they became Muslim, they fasted the remainder part of that Ramadan. They started their fast after they became Muslim and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not direct them to make up past Ramadans. If it was obligatory on him, he would have said, okay, after Ramadan is done, the days you missed of this Ramadan, make them up. But he didn't say that, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If one became Muslim on the second day of Ramadan, for example, he starts fasting right after for the remainder of that month, whether it's 27 or 28 more days. There's no dispute. It's a an original kafir, who embraces Islam. He takes his shahada. He does not make up. He doesn't have to make up any of the previous Ramadans or days of uh, Ramadan that he missed out before his shahada. His fasting during kufr invalidates the fast. It's not acceptable fast. And his Islam is forgiveness for any Ramadan or days of a Ramadan that he missed out on. Along with, of course, all his previous sins. He's like a newborn, free and clear of his sins like a newborn. A new start. Now that's the original kafir. The next issue we have here is, what if he's a murtad? A murtad means an apostate. One who was Muslim and then left Islam. Some rulings that pertain to uh, Murtad are different. Overall, you know, if you look at them, there's many rulings that pertain to a Murtad that are different than original Kafir. Even though both are considered Kafir, both apostate and original Kafir fall under the term Kafir. But there's some slight differences. A Murtad is much worse than an original Kafir. Now there's a Murtad who came back to Islam. He was an apostate for some time. He decided to come back to Islam. That he left Islam. Many who become atheists. And then they decide to come back to Islam. Uh, while we said 
An original kafir does not have to make up past Ramadan after he braces Islam by ijma'. No dispute. A murtad apostate is slightly different in this issue in that it's disputed. Whether he needs to make up previous Ramadans that he missed while he was a murtad or not. So the only difference in this matter is it's slightly disputed for a murtad. However, the overwhelming majority say that an apostate does not need to make up the fast that he, uh, he missed out on while he was a kafir and a Muslim. Imam Ahmad in one of two opinions said he needs to make it up. The correct opinion of those two opinions is that apostates are uh, like an original kafir. The same hukum applies to them. The same ruling applies to them. They don't make up or they don't have to make up missed Ramadans. Why? The same verse applies to them. Uh, they fall under the same category in same term. Say to those who have disbelieved, if, they, if you, seize in your, you seize from your kufr, your sins will be forgiven. That kufr, the term kafir in that verse, is broad. It encompasses both an original kafir who is a kafir and an apostate who falls under the term kafir as well. So there's no... Uh, room or no need to distinguish between two the two in this matter had we had specific proof on that then yes we would distinguish uh, between the two in this matter but there is no specific proof on that issue a murtad or an apostate is a branch of kufr just like an original kafir is another branch of kufr it's merely different branches to kufr so once a kafir embraces Islam or an apostate returns, he does not need to make up any missed Ramadans. Allah will forgive the past, inshallah. Now another issue, or rather a scenario. We said a kafir does not make up past Ramadans. And we said apostate follows along with that. In the correct of uh, two opinions on that matter. The day they embrace Islam, Allah forgives all. What if a kafir, a non-Muslim, takes his shahada at dhuhr time, in one of the days of Ramadan? We said he doesn't make past, he doesn't make up past Ramadans or past days while he was a Muslim. He doesn't have to do that. No matter how many days or years, if he became Muslim and when he was 60 years old, he doesn't make a single day or year from the past ones. But now he's on the second day of Ramadan. It's the second day of Ramadan. He comes in the masjid at Dhuhr time or Asr time. He says, I want to declare my shahada. Previous days, the first day of that Ramadan, he doesn't have to make it up. Previous Ramadans, he doesn't make up. That particular day that he became Muslim, does he make it up or not? This is actually a very, very close dispute among the ulama. The overwhelming majority, the jumhur, uh, say that he, on that day, for sure he abstains from uh, anything that avoids fast, from the point that he became Muslim. Like he doesn't no longer, after he becomes Muslim, he doesn't eat, drink, or have intercourse with his wife for the rest of that day. But since he became Muslim on that day, they said it's safer for him to make up that day after Ramadan. That's probably the best of uh, opinions. There's no proof either way on that. So the Jumhur's rationale is probably closest to being right. Now there's an issue. The author said Ramadan is wajib on a Muslim. Is the author here trying to imply, or when you read this in fiqh books all over, are they trying to imply that Ramadan is not wajib on a kafir? This goes back to a major issue in usul. And that major issue is our detailed obligations of Islam prescribed upon a kafir. Tawheed is directed and prescribed to a kafir. But what about the details of Islam? Like hajj, fasting, not dealing in usury or uh, not committing zina. Do the orders of Allah, like fasting, encompass a kafir or is it just a major tawheed that they're directed uh, with the correct opinion on this matter is that the word of Allah the speech of Allah the commands of Allah 
is directed to kuffar, non-Muslims, in both the principle, which is the Tawheed, and also in the detailed orders of Islam. Some of the ulama uh, I've read narrated an ijma' on this issue. But there's a dispute. So how can there be a dispute when there's an ijma'? Uh, the ulama justified it that early on there was an ijma' and that should be sufficient. But a dispute developed later on, uh, over time. So the fact that there is ijma' uh, should not have left any room for any dispute after that. Uh, Tawheed is directed to a kafir. No doubt. No one disputes that. But for example, let's take for example fasting. Is he obligated to fast as a kafir? Is the command of Allah, the speech of Allah, ordering to fast include a kafir? Yes. The author's statement, fasting is wajib upon a Muslim, does not mean fasting is not wajib on a kafir. That's not what he's saying. It means fasting is wajib on a Muslim. Which means it's not accepted from a kafir in his status of kufr, whether he's an original kafir or apostate. The order of fasting and other commands are directed to a kafir as well. And he's obligated to fast. But to do so, first, he needs to fulfill the condition of embracing Islam. Therefore, he's not stating that fasting is not obligatory on him. He's saying fasting is not accepted. So when the fuqaha say that, they're saying fasting is not accepted while they're on the status of kufr. Fulfill that condition before you fast. Allah said, Nothing prevents their contribution, their charity from being accepted from them except that they're dis they disbelieved in Allah and His Messenger. Their disbelief in Allah and the Messenger deprived their charity of being accepted. Charity is not accepted due to their kufr. And likewise, fasting is not accepted due to their kufr. Enjoying Islam, become a Muslim, so that it will be accepted. The author is trying to enlighten us that fasting of a non-Muslim who abstains from pre-dawn to sunset while he's a kafir is rejected. That's what the author is trying to say. He didn't fulfill the first rule of fasting, the first condition of fasting, which is Islam. Just like abstaining from food uh, from pre-dawn to sunset is a condition, a condition of fasting is Islam. And Islam is a condition that pertains to that person. Just like purification is a condition for your salah to be accepted, Islam is a precondition for fasting to be accepted. The order of Allah to fast is directed to a non-Muslim and a Muslim. The author's statement only and merely means that before he fasts, he needs to fulfill the first condition of being a Muslim in order for that fast to be accepted. And why I point out this is because this, you'll find it all throughout the fiqh books. They're going to tell you your salah, the first condition for your salah, for example, is a Muslim, Hajj Muslim. They're not trying to exempt the non-Muslim from the command. They're just saying that's a condition. What's the proof that details of Islam are directed to a non-Muslim? and that they're obligated uh, to follow them. Among that is the, the broad general speech. O mankind, worship your Lord. Ya nas, u'budu rabbakum. He said mankind, meaning Muslims and non-Muslims, which includes u'budu, includes tawheed, and it includes other aspects of worship. So he's telling everybody, Muslims and non-Muslims, embrace Tawheed, which is the main ibadah, and then included in that is other types of worship. So he was directing the speech to everybody. Yeah, the verses in the Quran, Ya Bani Adam, O sons of Adam, that's everybody, Muslims and non-Muslims. Wa aqimu salah, perform your salah. In general, does it say only to the Muslims, for Muslims and non-Muslims? Uh, in fact, when the kuffar are asked in Jahannam, why are you in Jahannam? 
ما سلككم في سقر Why are you in سقر قالوا لم نكن من المصلين What has caused you to enter hell The first thing they say is لم نكن من المصلين We were not among those who used to offer salah Look at what they say ولم نكن نطعم المسكين And we did not used to feed the poor We did not give the charity We didn't give the miskin their rights. Look at these matters that they're saying caused them entry to hellfire. Meaning we used to talk falsehood. Falsehood means it's falsehood. Everything that Allah dislikes and prohibited. And included in that is vain talk as well. وَكُنَّا نُكَذِّبُ بِيَوْمِ الدِّينِ We used to disbelieve in the day of judgment. The reasons they're saying they're in Jahannam is leaving salah, talking falsehood, and not giving charity. The main reason they are in Jahannam is due to their kufr. That's why they're really in Jahannam. But the torment is worsened on top of the punishment of the kufr. Why? For leaving the details of Islam out as well. They clearly stated four reasons from the details of Islam. They didn't make their salah. They didn't give the poor their rights, their charity. They spoke evil and falsehood in that which Allah dislikes. And they disbelieved on the day of judgment. So in addition, they're saying, in addition to their kufr, they're being punished for these matters, which are matters that are uh, uh, not Tawheed. It's not uh, Tawheed and Shirk. If they were not being punished for these details, then it would be futile to mention them. They mention those details because those are details of Islam they are being punished for. Therefore, they are being punished for details of Islam that they didn't do and the principle of Islam, which is Tawheed. Because the Tawheed in the details of Islam are both commanded upon them. The original and main reason for their punishment is due to their shirk, no doubt. But it gets multiplied on top of that for the details of Islam that they did not do. These are among the proofs that the ulama use that the non-Muslims are commanded by the details of Islam. الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا وَصَدُّوا عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ زِدْنَاهُمْ عَذَابًا فَوْقَ الْعَذَابِ Those who disbelieve and hinder from the path of Allah, they'll be given torment over torment. They disbelieve and they hinder people or men from the path of Allah. They will be given torment over torment. Zidnahum adaban fuq al adab. So the torment over the torment they get punished for is the torment for the kufr, refusing the principle. And then on top of that torment, they're going to be tormented for the secondary matters of Islam, which is, in this verse, hindering people from the right path. Those who don't invoke anyone besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nor uh, do they kill except for a just cause. وَلَا يَزْنُونَ They don't commit adultery or illegal sex, sexual acts. وَلَا يَزْنُونَ And whoever does that shall receive the punishment. وَمَنْ يَفْعَلْ ذَلِكْ يَلْقَ أَثَامَ The torment will be doubled to him on the day of judgment and he will be, uh, he will be in hell disgraced. Allah said they get tormented for three sins. For their shirk, which is the principle. Then he mentioned killing, unjustly killing someone. Another one they'll be tormented for is illegal sexual relationships. And the second two are secondary matters of Islam. 
The first one, of course, is a principle. So that means they'll be punished for matters that are secondary matters of Islam, just like they will be punished for the original kufr. يضاعف له العذاب. His sin is multiplied over on top of the shirk. Why? For secondary matters that he was commanded with. Zina and killing. Even more clear than that. وويل للمشركين الذين لا يؤتون الزكاة. وويل للمشركين الذين لا يؤتون الزكاة. Woe to the mushrikeen. Woe to the mushrikeen. That's the first verse. الذين لا يؤتون الزكاة. Had the speech of the details of Islam not been directed to non-Muslims, it would be, the verse would go like, woe to the mushrikeen, period. Or, woe to the mushrikeen for their shirk. But here it says, woe to the mushrikeen, who, who, for their shirk, الَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْتُونَ الزَّكَاةِ Those who do not give the zakah, and they are disbelievers in the hereafter. Who are they? The ones who don't give the zakah and they're disbelievers in the hereafter. He said, woe to their mushrikeen. For their shirk? No, that's obvious. That's the first part. Well, that, that's definite. But in this verse, he said, for not paying zakah and not believing in the judgment day. They're going to be held accountable for the details of Islam and for the principal foundation of Tawheed. That's a matter, like I said, many ulama said there was an ijma' early on, and there should have never been a dispute after, even though there is. You will see a dispute on this issue. Uh, the, how does this tie into our study? Did we get off track? No, we didn't. It's important, and it's important in fiqh to know this, because the author said, لِكُلِّ مُسْلِمٍ The fasting is obligatory on every Muslim. He said the Ramadan is wajib on, on a Muslim. You don't want to get the wrong impression. The statement seems to imply that a kafir is exempted from fast in Ramadan. Or the obligation upon him of that. Uh, or that he will, not be get, he will not be punished for that. A kafir is included in the order of fasting. Like the other orders of Islam. But the statement of the author and the fuqaha. When they use it in such context, it does not mean to exclude a kafir. It mean, doesn't mean he is exempted. When they say Ramadan is wajib or Salah is wajib on a Muslim or Hajj is wajib on a Muslim, that's the first condition you're going to find in those matters. When they say that, it doesn't mean a non-Muslim is exempted from those obligations or that those orders do not encompass him. The fuqaha in such uh, statements mean fulfill your condition of Islam so that the order you were commanded with will be accepted. The order of Siyam. With this, uh, inshallah, we'll conclude today. Jazakumullahu khaira. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. I think there's a few minutes for questions.